And, you know, the, the scope here is to design, or excuse me, to discuss some of the most common techniques used in rotator cuff repairs with anchors uh, and to provide some evidence of the e efficacy and safety of these techniques and to discuss some of the uh, some of the comparisons between single row and double row constructs and to provide some insights as to how I employ these techniques into my practice, being uh, um, a man that, uh, or a surgeon that uses anchors routinely. Um, what I, I won't discuss is, you know, there's a huge, uh, this could be, you know, of course, talks into their own, uh, but to discuss the multiple anchor uh, designs, the different uh, composition of anchors. I'm not going to discuss the various sutures and tapes used within these anchors or discuss the comparison of anchors to true transosseous techniques. Um, now obviously, that will be discussed later uh, in, our, in our webinar here. Um, if we look at the goals and principles of a rotator cuff repair, well, really, you know, our goal, of course, is the patient. You know, we're, we're aiming to, to get the best functional outcome we can uh, or clinical outcome for our patients. So we're, we're, we're aiming to reduce or alleviate pain. We're trying to restore their motion and their strength, return our patients to, the, to their activities, and minimize the economic burdens of our efforts to do this, uh, to, to, to um, accomplish the above. And we're also trying to avoid complications, of course. And to do this, the principles of treatment, we're trying ultimately to provide an environment that is favorable for tissue healing and restoration of anatomy. And to do this, we need to be able to recognize tear configurations for appropriate repairs. And this requires adequate visualization. We need secure fixation uh, of the tendon to bone, approximating the tendon to bone at the repair site and to resist initial displacement and have a stable construct for as long as it takes for the tendon to heal and to allow adequate surface area contact for appropriate healing. Our repairs need to be tension free or as low tension as possible. And of course there's uh, many described and discussed mobilization techniques and we need to try to promote the biology of healing best we can. So uh, there is some value of having gray hair and I've uh, had the, the fortune of being able to, through my, my training and my career, to kind of span uh, uh, open techniques to many open techniques, ultimately to being uh, mostly arthroscopic or almost exclusively arthroscopic now. So when I did my training in residency in, as a junior resident, we performed open acromioplasties and rotator cuff repairs routinely. As a senior resident, we were performing uh, shoulder arthroscopies largely for diagnostic, for diagnostic reasons, but also for acromioplasties, uh, but performing most of our rotator cuff repairs mini open. When I moved to my fellowship with Mr. Bell in Melbourne, uh, we did arthroscopic acromioplasties and distal clavicle excisions uh, routinely, but almost all of our rotator cuff repairs were mini open with a hybrid uh, construct fixation with uh, titanium metal anchors and lateral transosseous sutures with PDS. And then, but now, uh, 17 years later, 99% of, of my rotator cuff repairs are arthroscopics, and indeed, I use anchors to accomplish that. So you can ask yourself, oh, one thing I, I think is worth mentioning, I don't want to disenfranchise the folks that still occasionally or, or, or routinely do open or mini open rotator cuff repairs. I know this is a bit of a, a data study, but I think the sentiment is still largely true, and that is that, uh, that uh, this study would, would, would state, and I think we can echo that, there's not great, we haven't proven great advantages uh, or differences between these techniques uh, in terms of functional outcome. And uh, as of this JBGS article in 2007, they can't say that one technique is definitively superior to the other. So uh, I think there, there, there's probably still is a role for many open and open rotator cuff repairs. Uh, and I thought that was just worth mentioning. Uh, but what's changed in my practice uh, uh, given that? Well, I think the tools have certainly improved from when I began my, my um, uh, practice and my uh, passage through my career. We have now a whole host of, uh, and multitude of different anchors um, that uh, allow us knotless and, um, and, and knotted uh, fixation um, constructs. We have easier ways of passing the suture through the tendon. And overall, we have more tools at our disposal to perform these rotator cuff repairs arthroscopically. Um, you know, over the years, I'm sure my skills have improved to make this a more easier technique. And frankly, now um, I'm much more facile, I believe, arthroscopically because I do those so much more frequently than an open repair. Um, the techniques, I believe, have made me more comfortable. Uh, I think you can debate whether they've improved. I think they have, and I think the literature probably supports that. Um, but initially, you know, we had single row repairs. Uh, and then eventually we moved to a more footprint type of repair design with the classic double row. And that 
really made since I was trained uh, to to appreciate uh, and to want a, a larger surface area like a footprint style repair. That made me more comfortable moving into the arthroscopic arena for my repairs when we had uh, double row techniques. And now we've moved on to transosseous techniques, linking the medial row sutures to the light, uh, lateral anchors. And and I believe that has certainly made me more comfortable with performing my, my procedures arthroscopically. But also important, and I can't um, uh, deny, patient expectations have changed. I don't think these two uh, uh, nice elderly or, uh, or late middle-aged uh, people would be too happy with me putting a large incision on their shoulder when uh, Dr. Joe Blow down the road will just use a couple of small poke holes and cameras and instruments and do their repair. So certainly patient expectations have changed as well. Well, if we talk about the broad categories of rotator cuff repairs with anchors, uh, we largely divide these into th uh, uh, three areas. We have single row techniques where you use a single row of anchors with uh, suture fixation to, or, or tape fixation perhaps to the, uh, uh, to the rotator cuff. And then the classic double row, double row where you'd have a medial row of anchors and then a, a lateral row of anchors, each with their independent sutures or points of fixation to the rotator cuff. And ultimately, um, we've developed transosseous equivalents that are linked double row constructs, which link the medial uh, um, sutures to the lateral rows uh, mechanically. And we can subdivide this category into basically knotted transosseous equivalent techniques where the medial knots are tied and then knotless techniques where the medial rows are not tied and affixed to and uh, definitively to the lateral row anchors. So just, just a word about this, not all single row constructs are the same. Um, there's, and this makes it a bit difficult to compare, of course, in, in, in the literature and, and, you know, because the anchor position can be medial, um, uh, as in just a standard medial repair, but a trans tendinous, uh, uh, partial articular sided tear, or even Dr. Snyder's, uh, SCOE row, where he has medial anchors and a lateral, uh, series of bone vents, uh, in, inducing this crimson duvet or biologic, uh, or to, to enhance biologic healing. And then there's, uh, you can place the anchors in the middle of the footprint uh, with or without medialization of the footprint. Um, and then you have uh, the, you know, placing the, rank, the anchors on a lateral, on the lateral uh, uh, part of the footprint as well. Um, when we talk about double rows, we talked about the classic double rows with two rows of anchors, each linked to the uh, tendon with their own sutures. And then we have the linked double row constructs or the so-called suture bridge uh, constructs or the transosseous equivalent. And again, these are subdivided into those with medial, where the medial sutures are tied for points of fixation or then, or when the, uh, the medial sutures are, are not tied and are, have knotless fixation medially. And the basic principles and the reasons for developing transosseous equivalent are number one, to maximize the pressure contact of the tendon to the bone, to decrease the tendon strangulation because the lateral tendon is not penetrated by sutures. Uh, to preserve the vascularity over the lateral tissues owing to the absence of lateral knots, to avoid crowding the footprint with multiple anchors so the second row is placed off of the tuberosity footprint laterally, and to mechanically interconnect the anchors for better load sharing and less tension mismatch uh, within, with any given anchor with rotation, and also to prevent synovial fluid access to the rotator cuff footprint as opposed to a single row, particularly one placed laterally or medially. So what, what do we know? What, what can we find in the literature that tells us uh, how these two different basic constructs or three uh, constructs uh, perform against each other? And this is probably the best summary I can find, which is a 2019 uh, review article from the Orthopedic Journal of Sports Medicine. And it's a summary of basically single row, double row, and transosseous equivalent techniques. And it compares the biomechanical characteristics of all these different constructs. And it looks and summarizes the meta-analyses of level one and level two studies comparing single row and double row uh, rotator cuff repairs. So what are the mechanical differences between the single row and double row techniques? Uh, well, in this article, they reference Meyer's uh, uh, paper where the, it showed that the double row fixation more consistently reproduces the area of the footprint. And again, this was one of the the, the reasons I was more comfortable with moving to arthroscopic repairs being a footprint uh, person myself. Um, Dr. Park uh, discussed uh, applying more pressure to the contact area with the repair uh, with double row techniques. And then there's multiple studies that have looked at strength and uh, resistance to gap formation and 
and stiffness and resistance to failure under cyclic load. And the double row obviously outperforms the single row. And this is not a surprise, of course. The biomechanics should improve or increase with more sutures, more points of fixation, and larger surface area of contact. Of, of contact. Well, what do we know about the mechanical differences between the classic double row and the transosseous equivalent techniques? And there, there is some evidence that uh, that the transosseous equivalent does outperform uh, to some degrees. Uh, Dr. Park, ultimate load to failure was higher in the knotted transosseous uh, equivalent techniques versus the classic double row. And there was more contact pressure and overall uh, contact area and uh, greater pressure with the transosseous techniques. And Dr. Hada uh, and Elitrosh, arth or, uh, uh, article in arthroscopy in 2016 talks about more uniform stiffness uh, distribution across, across the repaired rotator cuff tendon with knotless transosseous equivalent techniques versus the classic double row. So overall, the transosseous tech, uh, equivalent techniques appear to have more favorable characteristics than the classic double row techniques. Uh, what are the mechanical differences in the various transosseous equivalent configurations? And there's controversy about this of uh, whether you should tie the medial knots or where you shouldn't. There's been some studies that have suggested less gap formation, less failure to load, and prevention of synovial uh, fluid leaking onto the rotator cuff footprint with medial row uh, knots when you tie those. Uh, other studies have showed no significant differences in the resistance uh, to ultimate and cyclic load failures between the knotted and knotless uh, versions of transosseous equivalent. But we need to understand that the knotless repairs were largely developed to, to address the concerns of the primary failure of our repairs being at the muscular tendons junction, the so-called type two failure. So what are the outcomes in, uh, between, uh, that, that we have uh, uh, between uh, the double row and single row constructs? And this is a summary of the meta-analyses of level one and level two studies in the literature. And I'll go quickly through this because we're obviously limited by time. And I'll go through all these studies. And in general, uh, if you look at uh, some of these studies show no significant difference, and I think that's worth uh, noting. But in general, if you have tears that are greater than three centimeters, the functional outcomes appear to be better in double row techniques. There also tends to be a trend for more re-tearing with single row techniques, particularly the partial re-tears uh, following surgeries. And there's concern that these partial re-tears, although they may not have any functional uh, or, or effect on the functional outcome in, in the short term or, or medium term, as these progress perhaps to full thickness tears, uh, the, the functional difference may be more different between the single row and double row techniques. So what do we know about the summaries uh, comparing double row, the different double row constructs? Uh, so looking at functional outcomes and healing, healing rates between, between the transosseous equivalent uh, and the classic double row techniques. And uh, if you notice in this column, there's absolutely no significant difference between the different uh, 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 double row techniques when it comes to functional outcome. Uh, Retear rates, there's conflicting difference. Uh, some uh, favor the knotted uh, and some favor the knotless transosseous uh, techniques. So not great data guiding us, which perhaps is uh, better associated with less uh, re-tearing of the rotator cuff. So just basically in conclusion, uh, the biomechanics, uh, uh, when we relative to the biomechanics, there appears to be biomechanical superiority of the double row techniques to the single row repairs, and that shouldn't be a surprise. There are theoretic advantages to the, the transosseous equivalent techniques over the classic double row techniques. Uh, and some research, at least biomechanically, has shown that, that, that that's indeed the, um, uh, the truth. And, but there's less clear advantages biomechanically between the various forms of the transosseous equivalent techniques. When it comes to functional outcome and healing, one thing I didn't point out and I think needs to be brought out is that both the single row and double row techniques are successful surgeries in improving patients' functional outcome. And that's pretty universal. The, the data would suggest though that tears that are greater than uh, three centimeters have a better clinical outcome with double row techniques. Uh, Re-tears of the tendon are more common in single row techniques, especially the partial tendon re-tears. Uh, and there, hasn't, there doesn't appear to be, or we haven't proven any significant clinical evidence and superiority of any specific double row techniques over the others. So what do I do? Just uh, putting this all together and, and, and how do I employ anchors in, in, in my practice? Well, for partial articular sided tendon tears, I typically do transtendinous repairs with, uh, in a single row. Um, 
Uh, and uh, unless it's very extensive, like I had a, a, a patient earlier this morning where the entire supraspinatus and, and a bit of the anterior infraspinatus was avulsed, and there's there was still some lateral tendon, so technically wasn't a full thickness tear, uh, but it's a large surface area, and I wanted a larger surface area for healing, so I placed uh, two medial row uh, anchors, and then I used a single lateral row to compress the lateral tendon against the uh, against the footprint for a larger surface area for repair. Uh, when it comes to bursal, bursal sided partial tears, I complete the tear and repair the rotator cuff tear as any as a full thickness tear. And a full thickness tear, so if they're quite small, less than one centimeter or a centimeter or so, I'll use a lateral single row. If they're full thickness and they're more than about a centimeter, I am a footprint guy. And so if they can be easily mo mobilized over the rotator cuff footprint, uh, then I'll use transosseous equivalent techniques with tying the medial sutures. Now, if I have massive tears that despite extensive mobilization can't medialize well or under a lot of tension, then I'll perform a single row repair uh, medially by, and medialize the rotator cuff footprint and use triple loaded anchors, very similar to Dr. Snyder's uh, SCOE row. So just some final thoughts. Uh, I think tension, tension is the enemy of healing. Uh, I, 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 I'm not in favor of crowding the area for healing. Um, I think margin convergence is a technique that make daunting rotator cuff tears uh, much more uh, uh, easily managed. And I would be, I, I feel it's important to be flexible in your techniques. I doubt there's one single technique that can address all of your rotator cuff repairs. Um, I know there's lots of fans of knotless uh, uh, devices. Lights, uh, please, it's time, please, Dr. White, can you? Oh, please? I'm sorry. No problem. Anyway. Just real briefly, I just want to say my concerns, economic burden of the implants, burden of the anchors and the greater tuberosity, and I'm concerned that, that there's more I can do to promote biology. So thank you very much.